to us today we bless you today we just say abba we belong to you we love you we are love we know we're love we know we are holy because you've made us holy we're righteous because you've made us righteous we thank you that you've placed us at the at your right hand in heavenly places in jesus christ and lord that's where we live thank you for the awareness of it we live in it we walk in it thank you for the fullness of your spirit working in us today as our whole life is a worship to you in Jesus name receive our studies as worship today father we thank you for what you're saying to us doing in us in Jesus name amen amen want to uh, just get uh, some things turned on here and uh, before we go uh, your uh, Initial instructor, Pastor Rod, has uh, some more of these. If you didn't get one, he's offering those to you, I understand, at cost. So talk to our sister here, and she's got them available for you over here if They're you 15. want those. $15. Okay. Let's see if we can uh, share this. That's not going to go very far. Get on the right one now. All right. All right. Well, we're going to uh, have to move now. Everybody have a good weekend. Uh, I feel like, you know, uh, I feel like we don't know each other yet, first of all. I feel like we need to have breakfast. Uh, so one of these days, maybe next Tuesday, you got yours. Can you pray over that and multiply that? <laughs> Passing that out. Uh, I was teaching a class at King's University uh, probably six, seven years ago, and it was a night class, and there was one couple. They weren't married yet. They eventually got married. But they would always come in. Five, ten minutes late, and they always had a bag of Whataburger full of, you know, hamburgers and French fries, but just for them. That's mean. That's mean. We could say it's rude, but it's just downright mean, right? I mean, mainly because it was still hot. You could smell it. Oh, my gosh. Nobody could concentrate, especially me. This has been an incredible weekend for me. I'll just start by letting you in on a little bit. We uh, attended, uh, my wife and I attended uh, Dutch Sheets uh, Reset 2020 conference. How many of you are familiar with Dutch Sheets ministry? You should. I mean, he's had a huge impact here across the nations. Across the nations was really his launching pad. And many of the, uh, the leaders that he runs with, if you want to put it that way, are out across the nations. And when you see what God's doing through across the nations, graduates around the world, it's a pretty amazing thing. Uh, this is my first semester to teach at Christ the nations, other than a couple of um, lectures in the pastoral ministry school. Um, but for decades now, I've been running into and hearing and seeing 
the fruit across the nations and the ministry uh, that has been put out. And uh, Dutch Sheets has had a call to intercession on his life for a long time and now a really an apostolic um, ministry and launching pad that's rooted in intercession, which is very much where my life is. And um, I think I told you the story about my 106 year old grandmother. She wasn't 106 at the time, but when I was having going through a really hard time in my life and she laid hands on me, she was an intercessor because she had to be because my granddad was an alcoholic. He was very abusive and he would, as soon as he'd get paid, he was a roughnecker working in the oil industry and in the panhandle of Texas. And he would get paid on a Friday and he'd be drunk by the time he got home Friday night. And sometimes he'd shoot up the house with his pistol. And uh, sometimes he'd, uh, he'd be abusive physically um, to uh, my grandmother, to his wife. And um, everybody was telling her she needed to leave him for her, her own safety sake. And she said, no, God's gonna bring Willie. She called him Willie. God's gonna bring Willie home to him, you know, get him saved. Uh, when Willie was 73 and his, uh, his liver was already shot from the alcohol and his lungs was ar were already shot from the, from the cigarettes, uh, he gave his heart to the Lord. And the last five years of his life, he and grandma walked to church together. It's just down the road. They walked to church together and he couldn't hear very well by then. Uh, and he had to kind of talk out loud and, Come on, Ma, let's go home. There's nothing happening here. <laughs> he didn't realize everybody could hear him. He passed away at 77, almost 77. She lived another 35 years to 106. And she was an incredible intercessor. And one day when I was going through some struggles, I went uh, quite a ways out of my way to get her to lay hands on me, pray for me. And when she did, the, the Holy Spirit said that the mantle that's on your grandmother in intercession I now place on you. So for a few decades now, I've been pressing into that. So Dutch is uh, uh, really wired much uh, like me. He's, he's done a lot more with it, but he's uh, got a heart for intercession. And so um, that's my heart. In many ways, I'll just be very frank with you. In many ways, in the days we're living in right now, teaching you these things about development, disciplines, personal values, things like that, seems a little trite to me, uh, though I know it's critical for where you are, for where I am right now. These are things that I've been walking in for, for decades, and, and I know that what's going on in our nation and what's going on in the church uh, is uh, really critical, critical, critical things. Uh, all that being said, my wife and I Thursday night went to uh, Middletown, Ohio, between Cincinnati and Dayton, uh, and the most incredible conference I've ever been part of. Now, I quit going to conferences for a while because I used to be a conference nut, and I went to so many conferences, and I would hear, you know, great things God's doing through this guy and that guy, and then I go home and try to do it. It wouldn't work for me. Why? Because God didn't tell me to do it. He told that guy to do it. So the Lord taught me how to find out for myself, how to hear his voice, how to do what he said. And so probably been 20 years since I'd been to any kind of conference in any kind of significant way. But when I heard that uh, Dutch was doing this reset 2020, kind of the, the culmination of eight years of a, an intercessory prayer journey into this nation and into the original covenants that our founding fathers made with the Lord when they came and established uh, this nation. Uh, and uh, this is the conclusion of that eight years. And so, we heard that the Reset 2020 was uh, being scheduled. We weren't sure if COVID was going to allow it to happen or not. But as soon as I heard it, I knew in my spirit I was supposed to go. And my wife said the same thing. So we we signed up for it, paid for it, got the airfares and all that stuff. Not sure that it was actually going to happen. Well, I'll, I'll just tell you from Thursday night to Saturday noon, was the most incredible experience of the church actually being the church, the ecclesia, the senate, the legislative body of the spirit, decreeing and declaring what God is doing in our nation and resetting 
uh, the church to be the church Jesus paid for, resetting the church to be the decreeing, declaring, uh, remitting, retaining, binding, and loosing uh, authority in the earth. And the church was in session. Court was in session. And uh, it was an amazing thing. If you get a chance and if you're interested, uh, that whole conference is, is available uh, on uh, YouTube. And you just go to Dutch Sheets Ministries and you can watch that. There was a sound that came out of that place. Uh, Dutch's brother Tim was the pastor of that church. And he said, in the 35 years I've been here, I've never heard that sound in this house. It was incredible. Um, and if I don't move on, I'm going to get stuck there and get really weepy. So uh, if you're interested in seeing what the Holy Spirit's doing right now in the midst of all the chaos that's going on in our world, I would encourage you to, to look at that. Um, the Thursday night, the first session, Dutch does a great job of just kind of laying out the preamble, the premise of the whole thing. And calling that session into order, uh, and it's there's the uh, an amazing anointing that was un unleashed there, and all the guys that I talked to that were there said that that same thing carried into their Sunday services, and the power of God just uh, same thing in our in our church as well. All right, we've got a lot to do. Did everybody do okay on your midterm? Most everybody did. Most everybody did. We had to help a few of you along, but most everybody did. Nobody flunked it. Everybody say praise the Lord. We still got a couple of people that are kind of getting theirs in today that uh, for whatever reason couldn't the other day. And um, so let's just see if we can get this to go. Here's one of the ones that many people missed. Uh, it was a multiple choice question. And many of you said Bible is perfect theology. Well, of course, Bible is not perfect theology. Uh, the, the Bible is a very dark lens. And so we've tried to be very clear to say the only way to really know uh, the Father is through the lens of Jesus Christ. Okay? Because if all you read is the Old Testament, you're going to get a skewed view of God. As angry... Hello? Are you still here? Did you go to Hawaii? If you go to Hawaii, I want you to just let me know because I want to go with you. Don't leave me here if you all go to Hawaii. Um, if you only read the Old Testament, you're going to come to the same place the Pharisees did. They're going to see God as a rule-keeping, bean-counting, measuring judge they're going to see him first and foremost as holy and everything else is unholy but what we see through Jesus is that God is not that he pulls the curtain back and he says uh, let me just show you what's really going on there there's a thief out here he's the one that comes to steal kill and destroy I've come that you might have life and everything you see me do is exactly what the father would do in that same situation so, sorry for the, the, the recourse, but Jesus is perfect theology. Can we say that together? Jesus is perfect theology, and he's the right perspective on God. The reason that's important is because you're going to have a wrong view of yourself if you think the Bible is perfect theology. But if you understand Jesus is perfect theology, if you want to see the Father, look at me. This is what Jesus said. He didn't say read the scriptures harder. He didn't say read the scriptures more. In fact, he told the Pharisees, who were the most Bible reading people on the planet, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have life, but you would not hear me, and I've come that you might have life. There's a difference between the graphe, the rhema, and the logos. The graphe, Paul says, actually kills, but the spirit gives life. Thank you for your enthusiasm this morning. <laughs> so God is relational by nature. This is the 
The other thing that was missed, uh, some of you, not all of you, some of you just nailed this thing, I think. Some of you got 106, 109. I can only give you credit for 100, but man, you, you had your basis covered. Um, but we're still missing. I don't know if you, you're not studying or you're not listening, but some of you are still thinking that God is first and foremost holy. Now, holiness is a byproduct of wholeness. Wholeness is overflowing love between a three and one God. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Have we said that? Yes. Yeah. So we've said that. I want to make sure you hear it. I know this has been stamped on you, stamped on you, stamped on you. God is first and foremost holy. No, he is holy. But holy is the byproduct of who he is. And, and John says, after 50 years of reflection, 50 years after Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, he says, God is what? Love. Love is relational. So God is first and foremost relational by nature. You say, well, why are you making such a big deal about that? Because if you try to make values for yourself, or goals for yourself, or a mission state for yourself, and you think that the whole goal is to get holy, then you're going to be climbing the wrong ladder. You're going to be in a straitjacket the rest of your life. If you understand that he's already made you holy, he's already made you righteous, he's calling you a saint already, and there's no perfection in your behavior yet. This is school, but you can say, yes, God, and praise the Lord. Amen. Go. You're doing good. Okay. The quietness worries me. Okay. And this was missed. I'm just going through three. That's all. We're not going to go through the whole thing. But just to try to go back and, and cover some bases, some of you that didn't get some very important pieces. The definition of the Trinity is important. It's a community. If you see God as one single monad up there, he's always going to be distant. There's always going to be a big moat around his castle and a big fence around his compound. And it's going to be hard for you to get in. And you're always going to be asking God to prove to you that he's near. But when you understand that he's a community of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and he sent the Holy Spirit to live in you. So you'd never have to question again if he's close or not. Okay. So those things are important. They're, they're important for us to lay a solid foundation for where we're going these next six weeks. We don't have very long to be together now. So we're really going to be tracking. And here's the way we're going to track. Today and Thursday, we're going to talk about discerning personal mission, uh, thinking tendencies, feedback. So, so we're asking you to think through the assessments that you've taken whether you did the SWOT analysis or uh, the DISC, the spiritual gifts assessment that I, I uploaded for you, you're going to need that input to see the fingerprint of God upon your life, how he wired you. You understand that's what assessments are about. They're to help you see how he wired you so that you can understand he's not going to give you a calling that cross or short circuits the way he wired you. He's not going to give you a love to work with mechanics and then put you in some kind of situation where you never get a chance to do that, teaching an art class or something. What he wired you to do is what you're going to have joy and passion in doing. And that's what we want to get to. Then we'll talk about leadership, core identity, mission and vision statements, personal development patterns. And yes, we're going to get to all of that in six weeks. <laughs> There will be, please hear this now, there will be some things that I'll have to upload, especially for those of you online. And since you're not here to receive the handouts, you're going to have to go to course documents. I understand some of you haven't been used to going to course documents, but course announcements and course documents become very important for us from here on out because of the things I'm going to be putting in, in your hands. All right. So let's go back to this. The circle overlap is about wholeness. If we take these three, you've seen this before. In fact, I've uploaded one that's a little more developed for you in your portal. If you've downloaded that, seen that, 
Right now, we see ourselves in three dimensions. There's coming a day when you won't be able to describe three dimensions because we will be so whole and so wholly integrated, we'll be one. But right now, we're spirit, spirit, soul, and body. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, right? Doesn't that kind of look like Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Okay, three in one. But here's the way we want to look at it for the next few weeks. Spirit, we're going to look at it through your spiritual gifts. What are your spiritual gifts? Because the gifts of the Father, the gifts of the Son, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit to you help you discern your calling, help you discern his path and his plan for you. He's not going to give you gifts and then not give you a way to exercise those gifts. This is this is really the, the primary uh, challenge. I'm going to talk to the ladies for just a moment now. Ladies, for centuries, you've been on the you've been on the back side of this thing, and the, and the men should repent. And here's here's what I want to say: the Holy Spirit won't give gifts, the Father won't give gifts, and the Son won't give gifts, and then not give you a venue or a platform to minister in those gifts. And so my wife is a preacher and a teacher and an incredible uh, professor right now. She's full-time academic dean for an online university. Uh, powerful. She's going to be teaching here uh, next semester. So if you see uh, cheeky, uh, cheeky Polo Wood, um, you, you ought to take her class. She's a lot better than me. But for years, decades, centuries now, women have had gifts, but they haven't had a place to release those gifts. This is one of the shakeups. One of the changes in the ecclesia is that we we have to release the gifts, not just the personalities, because the personality gets stuck by gender. Because yeah. men come across as authoritative, and we can run this thing, but we miss something when we don't have the female voice and the gifting that goes with that. God doesn't give gifts and then not give you a way to release that gift. Yeah. Now men can stifle that, denominations can stifle that, certain streams, organizations can stifle that. And that's where the women have to work harder, I'm sorry to say, to find a place for their gifting to flow through. I pray that I'm a part of the change. But it's true for all of us. God doesn't give you gifts and just to frustrate you. But it gives you gifts to flow through you. So your gifts, spiritual gifts, are a key to the equation of knowing your destiny, where you're supposed to go. So we're going to use the word passion. What's your passion? What's your joy? What flips your switch? In West Texas, we say, what cranks your tractor? What do you enjoy doing? What energizes you? What de-energizes you? Let me just uh, let you talk back to me for just a minute. Tell me some things that energize you. I love to encourage people. Encourage people. So you're people. People smart. Children. Children. Children energize you. Oh, my gosh. No shortage of work for you, young lady. <laughs> Ministry abounds for you. I, I look, I tell you. I look across the landscape of uh, the church world and uh, the cry that goes out the most, people looking for you. Somebody else, what energizes you? I'm not just talking about in the church. I'm talking about in your life. What energizes you? How many of you are energized by music? Any music smart people? You hear a song for everything? You, you, you can't go into a store without picking up on the on the music that's playing. And my wife, we can be in a store. She, she, she's not music smart. She doesn't hear, she doesn't hear music. And uh, we went into a restaurant one time, and they had one song on a loop. And by the time we got to the ninth go around on that song, I was just about going nuts. My wife hadn't even noticed it yet. So I asked the waiter, "Do you guys is this the only song you got, or is this stuck?" He says, "What? The song you're playing." He didn't hear it either. Nobody heard it because I'm wired music smart. Uh, who else? 
what what energizes you? Responsibility. Responsibility energizes you. Oh, well, you'll never lack a job. <laughs> Just don't create your own. Yeah. Creative arts. Wonderful. Painting, dancing, whatever. How many of you energized by landscaping? Anybody working with your hands, working outdoors, planning stuff? Yep. Um, I love that. Uh, you know, when you pastor for 40 years and you realize you're pouring into people, pouring into people, sometimes you don't see any change. You take a day off and you go out in the backyard, you dig a hole with a shovel, you drop a plant in there, cover it back up, and whoo, voila, change. Whoa, something happened. And it's, that's amazing therapy for a pastor or a psychologist or a counselor or somebody that works with people a long time and sometimes don't see the change. Okay, how many of you could name a couple of things that de-energize you? You do it because you have to do it, but by the time you're through, man, you just worn out. I need somebody to do that for me. Anybody? Okay, administration's that for me. I detest administration. Fortunately, I married a lady that loves and is gifted in spreadsheets. I mean, she can work spreadsheets. It's a gift from God. In fact, the Lord told her one time she was kind of she was kind of down on herself because she she had all this ministry in her, but but wasn't getting opportunities to share it. And the Lord just said, "I love when you do spreadsheets," and it changed her whole perspective because He wired her to do that. Somebody else, what what de energizes you? Midterms. <laughs> Me too, bro. <laughs> I have to grade it. Now you think about in schools where they're writing five and 10 and 20, 20 page papers. I had a class at the King's University with 105 students and five assignments 105 times. You're not sleeping much. And when you're reading the same book critique 105 times, oh my God. Gosh, you're talking about going crazy. So uh, I paid an assistant more than I was paid to teach the class to help me with the administration. It was driving me. So there are things in our soul, mind, will, and emotions that energize us because God wired us to love those things. And sometimes they don't fit in our little world and people will slander or criticize or make fun of us because we like to do, I like to do interior decorating. I don't know why, I just like to do it. My wife doesn't do it, I do it. I do the interior decorating, I do the landscaping in our house, I like to paint. Uh, and so she says, go for it. And one of the things that makes for a great marriage, by the way, is when you learn to assign by gifting, not by gender. Now, if my wife thought that because she's the woman, she has to do the decorating, then, then we would both be frustrated because she would be no good at it and I wouldn't be able to do it, right? So when you need brain surgery, are you just looking for a Holy Ghost tongue talking uh, family practitioner or do you want the best brain surgeon you can find? You want the best brain surgeon you can find. You want somebody with the gifts that are good at what they do. And unfortunately, we've gotten it so convoluted in the church that we thought it was all about personality. We thought it was about who could move the people, who could attract the most folks, all that kind of thing. And so we've got people sitting in the church pew that are called to be pastoring, but they've never been allowed to grow in that. And so all they can do is criticize. Let me just give you a little pastoral uh, experience. I've learned and I've proven my theory that the people sitting in the pew in my churches that were the most critical were people that had, had a call to ministry, but they never said yes to the call. So they had eyes to see through a leadership lens, but they were stuck on the pew. One guy that I'm thinking of was a pharmaceutical rep. So he's, he's you know traveling the world, uh, selling his pharma drugs, but he's called a pastor. And so he's got eyes to see things that aren't going right in the church. And he's just critical all the time. And finally, it dawned on me what was going on. And I said, hey, dude, I got a good word for you. He says, what's that? After another criticism. 
I think you were called to the ministry when you were young and you never said yes. His head dropped just like that. I mean, it's like a prophetic word. Poof. I said, God's given you eyes to see stuff in the church because there's a call on your life to lead in the church, but you've never said yes to the call. He still hasn't said yes. And he's still very critical. So when you find yourself critiquing and criticizing certain things, maybe there's a calling there. You've got eyes for something, but you've not said yes to that or you've just not been encouraged. In it. Then the body, strengths and talents, hardwiring. We talked about the 10 unchangeables. Uh, and so that's an important piece. So the purpose of the assessments is really whether strength finders or squad or motivational gifts or disc or, or the various things you would take is to help you see in an objective way how God hardwired you for certain passions and joys. Don't ignore those. Some of us have such a judgmental view of God that we think if it's fun, it must be sinful. God's put it in my heart to, to go to Hawaii. That must be sinful. It must be the devil. No. You know, I grew up in this idea of God that if, if you ever said, God, I'll do anything, I'll do anything except Africa. Just don't send me to Africa. Well, the very thing he's going to do is send you to Africa. Have you ever heard that? That is a sadistic view of God. If God's going to, if he wants to send you to Africa, what's the first thing he's going to do? He's going to put a love for Africa in your heart so that you want to go worse than anybody else. You're going to do because he's going to give you the desires of your heart. And then he's going to give you the desires of your heart. So a few years ago, there were some uh, teachers in a, in a university and they were looking at their freshman class and realizing that most of the freshman class was reading at a 90 word per minute level. underscore that 90 word per minute level and they knew that for these folks to excel at the university level they're going to have to read better they were 90 words per minute with 80 percent comprehension at the same time there was a small group within that freshman class that were reading at 350 words a minute and at 80 percent comprehension so they asked the question what what would happen if we give all of our freshman class a speed reading, a six week speed reading course, and let's get their reading up so they can handle all the books they're going to have to read and can comprehend that. So they set out to do that. In the meantime, in the teacher's room, in the break room, they're kind of placing their bets. What's going to happen to those students that start out at 90 words a minute after six weeks of speed reading course, how much will they grow? How much faster will they be able to read? And what will happen to the comprehension? Well, most of the teachers thought, well, they've got so much expansion that can happen. Most of them are going to probably double their speed reading capacity. And so, well, okay, if they double, what about those that are already reading three feet? Well, I mean, they're already, they're already in the fast lane. They're already tracking. So the, the general consensus among the teachers was that the, the, the fast readers – already probably wouldn't excel that much faster because they're already kind of maxed out. In fact, some thought that some of the 350 readers would actually decline because they would spend so much focus on it that it would confuse them. They would have to read a different way than they used to read. So what would happen? So you tell me six weeks later, those students that were reading 90 words per minute, 80% comprehension, what do you think their increase was? Anybody want to guess? Just a guess. Double. Okay. Double. That'd be 180, right? 180 words a minute. Okay, what do you think? You can't see it here on my screen, but below that is, what do you think happened to the 350 words a minute group? Where do you think they went? Increase? A little? A lot? Okay. Somebody give me a number. How many words a minute do you think the 350 group went to? 600, okay? Take that one, 600. Here's what happened. After six, after six weeks speed reading, the 90 words a minute group 
went up to 140 words a minute, maintaining 80% comprehension. It was a 60% increase. Six, what do you think happened to the big one? The 350 word per minute group went to 2,900 words per minute. What do we learn from it? Well, they're really smart. Know what? The reason they were reading at 350 already is because they had a hard wiring, a proclivity for input information. My wife is wired this way. She has to be having input all the time. We're driving down the road. As soon as we get in the car, she flips open her phone and she starts looking stuff up. I wonder how much that house is. Oh, she goes to Zillow, looks that up. I wonder what that, oh, where's this thing going? And at the same time, she's got the, got the sat nav going, you know, and she's giving me directions. We've already pulled up into the parking lot of the place that we're going to, and she's still giving me directions. Why? She, she won't look up. She's just right there. She's all input. And it's marvelous most of the time. These people that were doing 350 were already wired for that kind of input. So when they got more specific training, they just went off the charts. The ones that were reading at 90 with no training, but really had no proclivity for it, they almost doubled 60% increase. What are we going to learn from this? It's very important that we understand it because this is where we're going. If you work on your strengths, you're going to see exponential transformation in your life. If you spend all of your energies working on your weaknesses, you're going to wear yourself out over a little bit of increase. This is why understanding how God's wired you is so important. Because if you're trying to be somebody else because they're wired totally different from you, guess what? You're going to work and work and work and work. You'll never be as good as they can be in their sleep. And you'll feel worse about yourself. You'll de-energize yourself. You'll be calling yourself names and you won't want to get out of bed no more. Okay, somebody feedback to me what I've just said. If you work on your strength, you'll have exponential increase in the encouragement of you. If you work on your weaknesses, you'll get depressed. You're going to de-energize yourself. You will be able to increase potential. I have to work at administration. I can't just not do administration. But I have to get here way early to set up this laptop and that all these kind of bits and pieces takes me longer. Why? I, I'm not really wired for it. I don't really enjoy it. And my sons love it. They, they set up record studios and, and recording studios, all kinds of They just run it all day long. What do we have to do? We have to discover our God given strengths and play to those strengths. Now, this is totally opposite of what you're going to hear from a lot of secular teaching. But you need to hear it. Why does secular teaching not observe strengths and weaknesses? Because a lot of it is built on an atheistic psychological foundation. And if you don't observe that God wires us Every one of us different, but he wires us with certain proclivities. And if we don't honor those God-given gifts, we're always warring against the very thing God made us to be. Go with the flow, man. Yeah. I heard that. Just go on. Okay. That's it. Very encouraging. If you want to know how to de-energize a teacher... Just yawn or fall asleep while he's teaching. Okay, four assumptions we're going to work with, and one of them is not on the screen, and so you'll have to write it down. Four assumptions. Number one, we are made in the image of a relational friend with God, thus we flourish in whole and healthy relationships. That's got to be a base assumption. When you're taking these assessments, it's not an individualistic, I did it my way. 
I'm going to go find out what God wired me, and I'm just going to go do it. Everybody else can just go wherever. No, God wired you to need others. Why do you give you certain strengths and not all the strengths? So that you would need others to do the parts that you can't do. So our weaknesses are not something that we are to be resentful about. They're to drive us to relationship. And one of the things that you'll learn when you hit about 40 is that the only way you're going to fulfill God's vision and God's dream for your life is to build allies that can help you do what you can't do. The sooner you get that one figured out, that you're going to need to build a team to fulfill what God calls you to do. You may be leading that team or you may just be on that team, but you're going to need to be a part of a team to fulfill what God calls. The sooner you're going to get there. Secondly, that Christ is building his church and he's put into each local church. The people that carry the strength needed to fulfill that church mission vision. We have what we need to have. We just have to see it positioned. So as a pastor, I believe this. I believe that when I look at a congregation, as that congregation is healthy and grows, then God's going to bring into that congregation the gifts and the talents and the resources we need to fulfill whatever mission or vision the Lord gives us. Now, there may be a few things that we have to resource out, hire somebody from the outside to do it. But by and large, as a pastor, what am I looking for? The same way I would look into myself for my own strengths versus weaknesses to know God's call in my life. I look into the resources of the people in the church to help me understand and identify God's calling upon my local church. If God's calling me to win the world as an evangelistic outreach center, so to speak, and there are no evangelists in my church, there's a problem. So what do we have? God gives us the resources we need to do what he's calling us to do. Then God gives every member of the body gifts and strengths to fulfill their personal mission, uh, which uh, produces produces joy uh, in us. Let me just see where this goes. Okay. And then fourthly, please write this down. He is speaking to us and through us in the process. Matthew 4, 4. He's always speaking to us. So the good news is, you say, well, I just, I don't feel like I've got any gifts. Well, he's speaking. And his speaking creates in us, his word creates in us what his word is declaring to us. When God speaks to you, he's never just given you uh, a word of encouragement. He's never just given you information. He's always creating in you what his word declares. If God speaks peace to you, he's not just suggesting for you to chill out. He's actually depositing peace in you that was not there uh, before. So we've seen the 10 unchangeables. We're not going to go through that again, but I want you to pay attention to them. I trust that over the weekend you uh, did what we asked you to do. Just had a little conversation with God about these things. Is there anything here that I'm resentful about? Is there anything that I feel rejection over in any of these areas? Anything that I, I, I really haven't thought of this way, but I'm kind of, I'm a little ticked off at you because when you were passing out, you know, we said passing out looks, you know, you overlook me. Or when you're passing out brains, you, you overlook me. Those are, the kind, those are the little areas where Satan comes in and trips us up. And he either gets you working on your weakness to the exclusion of your strengths, or he just gets you mad at God so you can't receive more of what God has for you. How many of you know how to magnetize a ruler? You take a metal ruler and then you take a magnet and you just rub it the same way over and over. If I take a metal ruler and I just, with a magnet, rub it the same way over and over, what do I do? I transfer the magnetism into that metal by the direction of the force. This is what God's doing through your strength. 
This is what God's doing with your passion. He's wanting you to see that all of these point the same direction. If I was a little more artistic with this, I would have had a little target over here and I'd have had the arrows all going to that target. But all of your gifts, your passions, your talents, your spiritual gifts will all point to a target. That target is the mission of your life. And I know I'm repeating myself, but I'm doing it for a reason. Number one, because I've been delivered from the fear of repetition. Number two, because I know you need to hear it again. I want to underscore this. If you don't understand the gifts and talents and the wiring that God's put into you, you're going to wish you were somebody else. And you're going to be sidetracked. You're going to be tacking back and forth. You're going to go to this conference because you want to be like that guy. Then you're going to go because you want to be like that guy. Then you want to learn how to preach like that guy. You want to learn how to lead worship like that guy. And you do you're all over the place. But when you can see how God has wired you and then he begins to speak to you, life and direction, then you can be you and you'll sound like you. And that's freedom. A lot of us are running around singing and saying we're free, but we're still trying to be like Jimmy over here. I wish I could be like her. I wish I had her platform. I wish I could sing like that. No, you be you. You get in the quiet place and you hear the father's voice. And what he'll do is he'll start speaking to you about the things that he's put in you already. So ministry gifts, motivational gifts, the 10 unchangeables, your personality type, the disc would give us that. Uh, the way... Uh, uh, Socrates talked about the personalities was uh, choleric, phlegmatic, sanguine, and melancholy. Are you familiar with those terms? Most of us are. That's really what the disc is. The disc is the four basic temperaments of uh, the human personality. If you're, if you're trying to be a sanguine, you're trying to be the life of the party, and you're wired melancholy, you're always going to be sick of yourself. You're just going to be angry at yourself all the time. You're always going to be saying, I'll never be this. I'll never be that. Receive your wirings as a gift from the Father. And turn those things into praise. And it's going to be powerful. Okay. The question, do you see which direction God has magnetized you? Do you see his hand sending you in a particular direction or are you just enamored with everybody else's gifts it doesn't mean you reject their gifts you need their gifts too but you provide something nobody else provides so the last thing we want to do this morning is we just want to spend a little bit of time and i'm going to ask you to stop and think because this comes to the other side of those hindrances that try to hinder this clear direction in our life. And those are words of criticism or words of praise that you've experienced. So I want to ask you just to take, most of you have something to write with here. I want you to just draw a line right down a blank piece of paper. And on one side of that line, you're going to write negative statements and on the right side, positive statements, negative on the left, positive on the right. And I want you just to take the next five minutes and I want you just to be quiet for these last five minutes of this class. And I want to add, I want, I want you to ask the Lord to remind you of statements that you heard in your life that were either negative or positive about who you are and what you have to give. About who you are and what you have to give. Okay, let's just ask the Father to do that. Father, would you just speak to us today? Would you remind us of voices that we've heard that either rejected who we are, compelled us to try to be something else, 
or those that affirmed who we are? Would you remind us of those? Just write those down, if you would, for the next three or four minutes. All of us were born in genius. John Gardner's Harvard research said that 99.9% .9 of all children zero to two years old test in genius levels of multiple intelligences. By the time they're 10, that's dropped to 20%. By the time we reach 20 years old, that's dropped to 2%. Where does the genius go? A follow-up research study, the Gardner study, took that question as a PhD project and discovered that the genius is still there. It's just been muzzled, closed with slander and criticism. Conformity, creativity is muzzled out. Why won't you be like your brother? Sit down and shut up. Quit acting up. We don't act like that here. All those kinds of voices that get us to conform slowly muzzle the genius that God puts in us until we don't even know it's there anymore. We don't know it's there anymore. So I want us just to, to pray because this is a spiritual process. I want us to ask the Father to show us what to do with these words that we still remember, especially on the negative side of the ledger. On the positive side, you can have people with what I call goodwill projections. You know, sometimes what we call prophecy is really just a goodwill projection. It's exhortation. I want you to do well, so I'm going to prophesy the world is your oyster kind of thing. Sometimes we get praise out of flattery more than out of our own goodness and what God's made us to be. So those things can be equally harmful. Father, would you just speak to us about what you want us to do with these things? If it's a hindrance, if it's causing us to shun away from something that you've put in us, would you heal it? Would you give us grace to bless and forgive those that have stopped your hand from rubbing the ruler in the same way? I thank you for what you're doing in this, in this process. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to come in these next six weeks in this process of discerning, seeing, identifying, declaring that your hand along this rule of our life would just be so consistent and so clear that we can't miss it. In Jesus' name.
here's the last questions that we're going to take. Uh, and I'll upload this to uh, your student portal in course documents. So you can look at these. Are you finding ways to express your strengths and give yourself away? This is one of the things the Lord said to me in my 30s. He said, Carrie, know who you are and what you have to give. Believe in who you are and what you have to give. And then give who you are and what you have to give to those who will receive who you are and what you have to give. That, that brought great freedom to me, realize not everybody's going to receive it, and I don't have to expect everybody to receive it. But I do have to believe in it, know what it is, and give it away. Are you giving it away? Are you doing some things because that's all you know to do? Or are you really identifying what God's wired you to be and investing in your strengths? Are you doing some things because there's no one else to do it? Well, sometimes you have to do that for a season. But it'll kill you if it's not in your strength, in your sweet spot. Are you doing things that you don't feel you have interest, gifting, or calling for? I mean, you say class. Anybody say class? I'm, I'm in class right now. I don't feel like I, I was there. I hated school. So, yes, God has a sense of humor. Hated school. Some of these things we have to have, but we need to know what our calling is. Does your current assignment stir your vision, your passion, uh, your gifting, and your joy? What do you have joy about doing? Okay. I want you to take those questions and let that begin to ruminate in you. Begin to write those things out because your final uh, personal mission statement and your final reflection paper is going to be a lot about how you process those questions right there. Okay. Any thoughts? Words? Exhortation? Tongue? Interpretation of tongue? Song, hymn, spiritual song? No? Okay. Blessings on you. Have a great day. I can't hear you, sorry. I understand. No problem. Thank you, guys. If you don't have a lunch now, just come see me anyway. Yeah. Somebody came in really late. Wow. Stop the recording real quick.